The scripture reading today is from 2 Timothy 10 through 17, uh, chapter 3, 10 through 17. I'm reading from the uh, English Standard Version MacArthur Bible. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me in Antioch, in Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. Uh, this morning, I want to use our uh, imaginations. And so we're going to imagine for a moment, we all know the, the sport baseball, right? We're going to imagine for a moment that we are playing baseball. I, I know that we are sitting down and we're not standing up and we're, we're not in ready position for the batter to hit the ball. But we're going to imagine for a moment that we are playing baseball. Um, we are going to be playing the position of second base and our pitcher has a nasty habit of trying to play our position. In fact, our pitcher tries to play the entire field because he wants to be recognized by a professional scout that is sitting in the stands. And so he is going to do everything that he possibly can to be noticed by this professional scout sitting in the stands. And so his goal is to be noticed, to elevate himself while the goal of the team is to win a baseball game. Our pitcher, in having a goal that is not with the goal of the rest of the team, and in doing things a different way, and his drawing attention to himself, and is trying to gain the attention of this professional scout, he's going to accomplish two things. First of all, he is going to cost his team, us, the game. And secondly, he is going to hurt himself by gaining the attention of the scout who's going to immediately recognize that this guy is not a team player and this guy does not compete according to the rules. I find that life is much the same way. Many of us may have different goals in this life and we we find ourselves through life, particularly in our youth, trying to figure out which rules to play by. We find ourselves developing a system of living so that we can pursue the goals that we have in life. And last week, we, we learned in the scriptures that the world, the universe, was created by God for the purposes of God and for the glory of God Alone, And if it is the case that we exist, that we are created for God's glory, then that has to be our purpose in, in life. Yet, so often, we develop other purposes for living, and we'll talk about that just a little bit later after we uh, begin looking at the text. We often develop purposes for our own lives, and we develop a method or rules in order to live for the purpose that we have invented or clarified in our own minds, failing to compete, so to speak, in this life according to the rules. As Christians, as a, a people who follow Jesus Christ, that's what that word means, Christian, a people who follow Jesus Christ, we believe something very specific about the Bible, about the Scriptures. In our belief statement, you can see this on the back of your bulletin. In our belief statement, the second statement regards the Scriptures, and here is what it says. We believe that the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments 
are the Word of God, fully inspired, without error, and the infallible rule of faith and practice. The Word of God is the foundation upon which this church operates and is the basis for which this church is governed. We believe that the Word of God supersedes any earthly law that is contrary to the Holy Scriptures. And the verse references there are Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16, John chapter 17, verse 17, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 through 25, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and verse 21. And so this morning... The question is simple. The topic before us is simple. And we are going to observe this according to the text of Scripture. Is the Bible really the standard for all of life and all of ministry? And what are the implications of our making such a statement regarding the authority of Scripture? Sister, thank you so much for uh, reading verses uh, 10 through 17. I just want to look at two verses here that we read this morning. Verses 16 and 17. I want to look at it in three parts. First, we'll look at uh, the first half of verse 16. And we'll consider Scripture's source. Where does Scripture come from? Is the source authoritative? Secondly, we'll look at Scripture's purpose, and we'll look at the second half of verse 16, and then we'll consider verse 17, the result of Scripture, Scripture's result. First of all, Scripture's source. Where does Scripture come from? Look here, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and we'll read the first half again. All Scripture is inspired by God. All of Scripture is inspired by God. Now, to know the point that Paul is making, we have to know precisely what he is referring to when he refers to the Scriptures. We look... Up in the passage, verse 15, and it is clear that Paul is, first of all, referring to the Old Testament scriptures. He is writing to Timothy. Timothy is his student, and he is saying, you have known the sacred writings from your youth. Persist in these things. So when Paul refers to the scriptures, he is first and foremost referring to the Old Testament text. In 2 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. Excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. There's not a chapter 5 in 2 Timothy. Paul quotes from Luke chapter 10, verse 7, and he refers to this verse as Scripture. 1 Timothy comes before 2 Timothy. That makes sense, right? In context, Paul has already clarified, he believes that the Gospel of Luke is Scripture. He quotes from the Gospel of Luke, and in the Gospel of, of Luke, there is something that is particular to the Gospel of Luke, something that Luke is not quoting from the Old Testament. And Paul says, this is Scripture. So when Paul is writing here, he is referring to the Old Testament, and he is referring to the Gospel accounts, the story of Jesus' life. In 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, Peter is talking about what Paul has written down. And he said, guys, what Paul has written down is hard to understand. And some people are twisting what Paul has written, what he has given you to accomplish their own ends, to mean something that Paul did not mean when he wrote those things, like they do the rest of of the scriptures. And so Peter there identifies the writings of Paul as inspired scripture from God. And Paul understood his own writings to be divinely inspired and divinely authoritative for all of life and ministry. And you can see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 37 and 38, where Paul says, what I write to you is the command of God. 
And so when Paul is writing and he's talking about the scriptures, it's important for us to understand this. that Paul is not only referring to the Old Testament text. He was referring to the Old Testament. He is referring to the Gospels. He is referring to the writings of the apostles. And he was considered to be an apostle. And even as he was writing 2 Timothy, his understanding was, I am writing divinely inspired scripture. So we somewhere, we, we got this idea that the writers of the New Testament had no idea that they were writing scripture. The scripture itself it says something contrary to that, to that statement. The apostles knew exactly what they were writing down. They knew that they were writing Scripture. And as Paul is writing, and as Peter is writing, and as John is writing, the New Testament is already being circulated during the time of writing with the Old Testament text, and it is being used as divinely inspired Scripture. Somehow we get the idea that the apostles didn't know they were writing scripture or that the New Testament canon was put together by tradition years and years and years and years later. But that is not the case according to, according to the text, according to the, the record, a basic reading here. What the councils did later was affirm the books of scripture that had already been circulated together. And they removed books that had been added after the time of the apostles. They recognized that the canon of Scripture, the rule of Scripture, the standard of Scripture, it was closed after the death of the apostles. No new Scripture for this age would be given. And so in the councils, they went back and said, this was scripture this was added later and so this doesn't need to to be there all scripture the old testament and what we have in the new testament is inspired by god now i am inspired by the way that the new testament and all of scripture was put to together what does it mean to say that all of Scripture is inspired by the God of the universe? Uh, it is not the same as me being inspired by my wife's beauty. I am inspired to do many things because I love my wife. But that is not the type of inspiration that... Paul refers to as he writes to Timothy. Uh, this is not the same sort of inspiration uh, that I have among this body of believers. Do you know that you inspire me? Particularly by your generosity and by your immediate willingness to help those in need without expecting anything in return. Do you know I am absolutely inspired by that? Every church Katie and I have been in, I'll say almost every, almost every church that Katie and I have been in, people are worried about being taken advantage of. And so they are so, they are so put off by the idea of helping people who may need help. But in, in this church, immediately when we get here, we see the church donating money to people who need it, getting groceries for people who, who need it, getting our house ready for us to move into. And I just want to say to every single person here and every single person who's put labor and energy sweat, maybe blood. I don't know if blood was involved or not, but that house was a mess, okay? I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Katie and I want to thank you. We are inspired 
by your service to our Lord and, and to one another and to this community. But even that's not the type of inspiration that Paul is talking about here. He's also, he's also not talking about being inspired by, by fear. You know what I'm talking about? Inspired by fear. I need to run because I want to live. Inspired by fear or inspired by the prospect of failure, right? We see failure in the distance and so we are inspired to what well we either work harder or give up it'll be one of those two things but that is not the type of inspiration that Paul is talking about here when he is writing to Timothy what sort of inspiration is Paul talking about Paul is obviously writing this in his own hand. He's writing a letter to his student, Timothy, regarding some issues of the time. And so uh, inspiration does not mean that God is dictating what he wants to be written in Scripture so that the authors write word for word exactly what God is telling. That's not what's going on here. If it were, um, then I think the Bible would look vastly different than it does. It would all have the exact same language you wouldn't have the nuances of different authors and we see both of those things inspiration then is must be a movement from a divine source in the soul to write something for the benefit of of people it must be God working through human hands by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Scripture confirms this for us. Uh, Peter, uh, when he is writing his second letter, uh, be Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21, writes this, No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. So it's not Paul just writing by himself, I need to write this. There's some sort of inspiration going on. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And we're going to find that that is the rule for all of Scripture. And those of you men who are joining us on Monday nights for Systematic Theology, this is our conversation right now, the inspiration of Scripture. How was Scripture inspired? Why was Scripture inspired? What are the theories there? What does Scripture have to say? And we're going in-depth on Monday nights, so shameless plug, men, tomorrow night systematic theology and we have a good time too no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God and so when Paul who is going to believe the same thing that Peter believes right they're of the same faith they're of unity they are both apostles both being inspired by God to write and to teach the things that they write and teach Paul, when he refers to the inspiration of Scripture, refers to this. That through human hands, God speaks or writes the written word by, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is there as these authors are writing the text, right? It is there convicting and encouraging and working in the author's hearts as the authors are pinning this and the Holy Spirit is like an open dialogue. I don't, probably not audibly, but the conviction of the heart and mind by the power of the Holy Spirit writing the Holy Scriptures. And so it can be said that God is the author of Scripture. It is God's Word. But also that God wrote the scriptures through the hands of people. And I am inspired by this. We, we catch a glimpse into, into how God works. Right? From the creation of the world, from the moment time began, in the creation of humankind, people being created in His image, according to Genesis chapter 1, being His representative rulers over the earth, God does His work through His people by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as I, as I stand here before you, and I think I've mentioned this before, Andrew Cannon is not the name that must be remembered. 
Andrew Cannon is not the one teaching you his ideas about the world and about life and about ministry. No, we teach the scriptures here. We teach the scriptures here, and that is absolutely important. Everything that God does through the preaching ministry here at the church at Sunsides is, is God working through his people. The spotlight is not to be on me, but on our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And any ministry, any place of service in the, in the church, it is always God working through his people. God working through his people by the power of the Holy Spirit. You and I, we are so insufficient to accomplish the things of God. We, we, we cannot. And that is humbling, absolutely humbling for us. But God, in His grace and in His mercy, works through His people by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to ask a couple of, of questions regarding the inspiration of Scripture and what we believe. Uh, how might we know that we have the correct set of Scriptures? There are quite a few sets of Holy Scriptures in the world. We, of course, use the Holy Bible. Catholics will add the Apocrypha to that. Some will use the Book of Mormon. Jehovah's Witnesses use a different translation of the Bible that uh, we believe mistranslates some things. Hindus have the Vedas. Muslims have the Quran. How do we know that we have the correct set of scriptures here? We've actually already covered this over the previous two Sundays, so I don't want to spend a lot of time here. In fact, I think I'll just encourage you in this way so that we can save time this morning. On the church website, you can find those previous two sermons. Please go back and listen to those uh, where I mentioned textual criticism and how much scrutiny this set of scriptures has undergone for centuries and centuries so that we might be confident that we are reading the correct set of scriptures, the correct rule of law, the correct text that is truly inspired by the God of the universe. In our belief statement, uh, we make this um, claim. The scriptures are fully inspired without error and the infallible rule of faith and practice. What does it mean that the scriptures are infallible? And how do we know that the scriptures really are infallible? This question was partially answered last, last week or actually in the first sermon of this series. So again, go back and, and listen to that. Watch that if you haven't done so. We talked about how the scriptures are authentic, that is true to source, correctly matching the original documents. We saw how they are reliable in every instance where the scriptures can be tested against history. They tell the same story that history tells. We talked about how the scriptures were coherent. That means internally there being no contradictions. And we set out to basically prove those things. If you would like some other resources regarding that, it's a study called Apologetics. And you can find that on my blog. And I've recently published a book about those things. But please check that out. If you have any question whatsoever about the reliability, the authenticity, whether or not this is the true text of Scripture, all of those links are available on the church website. And I encourage you to check those things out. I wish we had time on a Sunday morning to get through all of that, but we do not. Somebody told me this morning, Pastor, please go longer on Sunday morning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let me just pull it up here and we'll... <laughs> no. No. We'll stay on task. We'll stay on target. Infallibility means this. That in every generation and every location, the scriptures are just as true and just as relevant for all of life and all of ministry. Infallibility is this. 
that in the scriptures no error can be found. And the scriptures cannot be proven to be false. Fallible means this can be proven to be false. Infallible means this thing cannot be proven to be to be false. Cannot be proven to be false. There are details in many sets of scripture throughout the world that you can look at those details and see, okay, that doesn't match up with what we know about history. There is not a single scientist or historian or archaeologist that will deny the crucifixion of Christ. In fact, they will say it is certain, certain that Jesus Christ, the historical figure, was indeed crucified by Rome. There is evidence there. And so any set of scriptures that say Jesus was not crucified cannot be the inspired scriptures of God. It is historically accepted, essentially proven in historical documents and the writings of Roman historians, specifically Josephus and Tacitus, and by the testimony of scripture which is considered a historical document that after Jesus' crucifixion, many, many, many people had experiences where they saw Jesus and talked with Jesus. And so any set of scriptures that would deny that fact cannot be the inspired word of, of God. The scriptures are infallible. This is what we say in our belief statement. So if we are created for the glory of God, if we exist for the glory of God, and God has given us a written word spoken by Him, breathed out by Him, inspired by Him, written through people by the power of the Holy Spirit, then this document inspired by God is going to be the rule of law not just for the church but for the existence of every person, right? It means that the Word of God is an explanation, a revelation of God's holy standard, a standard to which not only humanity but all of creation is accountable to the God of the universe. This is the seriousness of what we are talking about. But this stands in stark contrast to the way that most people live their, their lives, right? I am going to develop this purpose for being and I am going to figure out a means by which I can achieve this purpose that I have realized in and of myself. There are many, many TV shows and movies in which the purpose of life is at least implied. And as we watch TV and we, we soak up everything the television has to offer, again, my favorite network is Food Network, okay? Oh, man. Worst cooks in America tonight. Mm. I'm so excited. We watch television. We, we watch movies. The, the implied purpose of life is this. And tell me if you've noticed the same thing as we absorb the culture around us. The purpose of life is to survive. Live as long as you can. It's purpose number one. The second purpose is this. Find your your true love, the one in whom you can be satisfied for the duration of your life. The purpose that most people, I think, have in life, particularly in Western civilization, that's America, right? Particularly in Western civilization is this. Live a long and happy life. That is the goal, I think, that most people have. And so in order to live a long and happy life, I am developing these means by which I am going to achieve longevity with my life and by which I can achieve happiness in my life. But the 
purpose of our lives is loftier, according to Scripture. It is a higher purpose, a higher calling. And it is that my life would serve the glory of my Creator, the one who created me for His purposes, for His own enjoyment. So, just as our baseball illustration at the beginning, I, in my life, pursuing a long, happy life, I will try and play every position that gets me there. I will try and restructure the way that things are at their core, at their foundation, so I can pursue this goal that I have for myself. And what I end up doing in the process, first of all, I end up missing out on that satisfaction. That's not the purpose anyway, but that's my goal. I end up missing out on that because I'm trying to rewrite the, the rule of, of law in my life. And then my, my life ends up impacting others in a negative way because I haven't realized the, the, the great purpose for life and I haven't competed according to the rules that come straight from the God of the universe that are a reflection of His character. The scriptures mean something very serious in our lives then, don't they? Most often we are unwilling to read or to, or to listen. Let us be careful though, and I'll explain this just a little bit later when we move along in the passage. Let us be careful not to develop a workspace righteousness because of that truth. Number two, the second half of verse 16 Scripture's purpose. All Scripture is inspired by God and, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And I want to take each of these ideas and look at them individually. First of all, all Scripture being inspired by God is profitable. Scripture is profitable. What does that word mean? Profitable. Looking in the Greek, the word has a singular, explicit meaning, right? That something would profit us, that something would benefit us, that we would gain some sort of advantage in life and ministry. Do we realize that the Scriptures, the Scriptures were given by the God of the universe for our good? There are two ideas that are so prevalent in our society. The first is this, that in religious text, in Scripture, in religion, if you do this, this, and this, then you might go on to live a long and happy life. And so we approach religion according to a purpose that we have given ourselves, that we may achieve some sort of eternal bliss. This at the core is works-based righteousness. And brothers and sisters, we are insufficient. We can't keep the rule of law. All of our attempts are frustrated. Yet we approach religion and we approach the Bible in this way. If I can just follow this word, do A, B, and C. Bible means basic instructions before leaving earth. So I must just... If I follow these instructions, then I will be good. But that's not the point of the Bible. It's not why the Bible was given. It's not even why the Old Testament and Mosaic Law was, was given. The other extreme is this. If I do A, B, and C, then I will be good. Or, or, the Bible is this religious, dogmatic document that only makes me feel bad about my life. And those are the two extremes that we see in society. But here, what do we read in, in the text of Scripture itself? It is profitable. It is beneficial. Scripture was given so that we might gain some sort of advantage in life and in ministry so that we might gain some sort of advantage in life and in ministry secondly it is given for 
reproof. And often this is a terrible word. Do not tell me that I am wrong in what I, what I think, what I believe, what I am doing. But if Scripture is profitable, profitable for reproof, it means this, that when the Scriptures point out some insufficiency of ours, some sin of ours, something that we may be doing that doesn't honor and glorify the God of the universe, when Scripture points out that we lack understanding concerning some area of of knowledge or belief, it means that the reason Scripture does that is that we might profit by accepting the reproof of Holy Scripture, of God's Word. A good father does what? He disciplines his children. For reproof, for correction, Scripture doesn't stop at reproof. It doesn't stop at addressing those beliefs that we may misunderstand or those actions that may be sinful before the God of the... It doesn't stop there. No, Scripture gives the perfect and beautiful principles by which we might be corrected to grow up, grow into maturity. Even in business, worldly business, and in, in the way that we operate our household budgets. Okay, I'm going to talk about money for a second. Do we not, if we want to experience gain, consider where our deficits are? This is what Scripture is doing as it works to, to manage the budget of our lives. Right? We understand this principle when it comes to money. We don't often understand this principle when it comes to life and ministry. In order to experience gain in the realm of eternity, in the scope of eternity, we have to recognize our deficits. Scripture does this. It reproves. It corrects that we might profit, that we might benefit, that we might gain every advantage. Scripture is profitable also for training in righteousness. For training in righteousness. We could just all, for a moment, look back on our own lives, right? We are not a righteous people. I am not a righteous person. I've done many things that I am not proud of, and I have sinned before our Lord. Yet Christ, in His grace, chose to save me. Chose to bring me to Himself. And that is true for everyone who knows Jesus. So not of any righteousness of mine, but in a a righteousness imputed. That's what we call it, imputation. A righteousness that has been imputed by Christ. Him clothing me in His righteousness alone, because He is the only righteous one. raises me in His righteousness. Scripture is profitable for us in this regard, training in righteousness, because by the Scriptures, we learn how to live not according to our own righteousness, but we learn how to live in the righteousness of Christ. We grow into complete and mature people lacking nothing. Scripture is profitable for doing this. Scripture is profitable for doing this. So we don't we don't believe that the Bible merely contains the Word of God. And we don't believe that the Bible merely contains truth. We believe that the Bible, the text of Scripture, is the Word of God and is truth. This is our conviction. And so here at the church at Sunsites, when we teach and when we preach, we do not merely preach and teach from the Scriptures. We do not merely use the Scriptures as we preach and teach. We teach the Scriptures. We explain the Scriptures 
We expose the scriptures so that the scriptures might expose us for our good, that we might profit, that we might benefit, that we might gain the advantage in life and in ministry, because this is the purpose of the word that God has given to us according to this text, according to the, the apostle Paul, who was inspired by God and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Matthew, chapter 23, verse 8, Jesus would say this, Do not, do not call yourself rabbi, a Jewish word meaning teacher, do not call yourself rabbi, for you have only one teacher. Of course, he was referring to himself You have only one teacher. This is why I do not preach and teach the words of Andrew. Preach and teach Scripture so that God's Word, His unadulterated Word, might be heard and it might accomplish its work in our lives. What is the result of Scripture? Scripture's result, verse 17 here, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. In whom, in whom does Scripture accomplish its work? The first part of verse 17, the man, a generic word in the text of Scripture, even though it is masculine in the language, a generic word meaning the people of God. Those are the people in whom Scripture accomplishes its work. Those people who do not know Jesus, who have not been called by God who have not received the righteousness of Christ who have not first been changed at the heart level call that regeneration who have not been changed are not going to care what the word of God says it is not going to profit them or benefit them or give them the advantage See, our our faith in Christ, our relationship with Christ, does not begin with our understanding. And it does not begin with our submission. That's often the way we hear it taught, right? If you just come to Christ, if you just will yourself to come to Christ, it's not something we are able to do. No, regeneration precedes faith. God calls us, woos us, draws us, God changes us. And then we become hungry for His Word. If if we do not know Christ, why would we care what Christ has to say? Christ brings us to Himself. And as we come into relationship with Jesus, then we begin to care. This Word is profitable for the godly person, for the godly person. I want to backtrack just a second because I thought of a a text of Scripture that's very important for us to to read and to hear. Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 says this, Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So going back to this idea that if I forsake the purpose I was created with, pursue my own purpose, develop my own means, ultimately I do that in vain. I'm not going to accomplish the purpose that I create for myself anyway. I you broken cisterns for myself that can hold no water. 
But if I pursue the purpose that God has, according to His Word, then I will be fulfilled. Then I will be fulfilled. God's Word is profitable for the people of God. His work is accomplished in the people of God and His people. And in the glory of God, clothed in the glory of God, not the glory of self, not for my own satisfaction, not to try and draw people to myself. No, in the glory of God, I find the greatest satisfaction. I find the greatest satisfaction. The second part of verse 17, that the people of God may be adequate equipped for every good work. What does Scripture accomplish in us? It makes the people of God adequate. And their being made adequate would mean this, that I am now able, if I am the people of God, or if I am a man of God, or for the women, a woman of, of God that God has called into relationship with Himself, that if we are the people of God, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, makes us able, makes us able to come under the instruction of and submit to His Word. There is no other way we, people, concerned with our own righteousness and our own destinies and our own way of doing. There's no other way that we would ever come under the instruction of someone else. God brings us into that, makes us able to sit under the teaching of His Word and to submit to His Word. Isaiah chapter 55 verses 10 through 12 would say this, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So will my word, says God through the prophet Isaiah, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing that desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. God calls the people to Himself. The people that God calls to Himself are hungry for His Word. His Word accomplishes what God purposes it to accomplish in our lives for our benefit, for our good. And as a result, personally, in our lives on this earth and forevermore, we go out with joy and we see the entire world with fresh and new eyes. And if you know Jesus, you have experienced this. It is, it's, it's amazing. God is worthy of our praise. He doesn't just say, you have a responsibility to follow me and do everything I say. No. Even though we have not done that, even though we do not do that, still He calls the people to Himself. Still, He grants us understanding that we cannot gain on our own. He gives us a desire to absorb His Word, a hunger for His Word. He gives us that. And then, abiding in the glory of God, we then receive as a gift from God, by grace alone, the highest satisfaction. A satisfaction even higher than that of the closest intimacy. God is so good. So we have the responsibility to obey God entirely, to keep His rules, to compete according to the rules. Yet not a single one of us has done that. God by grace has called the people to Himself. 
amazing. God is good. Even though we did not compete according to the rules, God calls the people to himself, creates a hunger for scripture. And as we abide in his glory, according to his scripture, satisfying our hunger by reading the word, sitting under the teaching and the reproof and correction and training in righteousness, then we also receive unsurmountable joy and peace. That is what the scriptures tell us and lead us into. This is amazing.